Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the multiplication principle. And basically what the multiplication principle says is if you do two operations in order, and if you know how many possible outcomes there are for the first operation, and you know how many outcomes are possible for the second operation, then there are, you can just multiply those two numbers together to get the total possible combined outcomes of the first operation followed by the second operation. So a simple example of this would be if you had um, three different sizes of pizza that you could order and then you had um, you could order a one, you wanted to order a one topping pizza and if there were five toppings I know this is not generally a pizza place has more than five toppings but let's say that you could pick from five toppings and you said okay I can order a small medium or large pizza and I can choose from whatever you want to choose, beef, sausage, pepperoni, mushroom, olive, as a topping, single topping, then that would mean that you could multi you could actually order, since you, there's three sizes and there's five toppings, there's 15 different pizzas that you can order. Okay, so now we could extend this a bit further and so let's say let's go back to this and say there's three sizes of pizza you can order but let's say there's again five toppings but you get to choose one of two crust types so now if you throw in a third operation here choosing the crust type then now that extends it to three times five times two which would be 30 different one topping pizzas that you could order. So so anyway, that's uh, that's how that works, and that way you don't have to sit down and list every possible combination of pizza you can order to figure out how many possible pizzas there are to order. So let's look at a simple example. Uh, example one says, suppose you are getting ready for work and notice that you only have two shirts and three pair of pants are clean. How many different outfits can you put together if you choose one shirt and one pant? Well, your first operation um, would be, and it doesn't matter the order, but I'm going to say the first operation is selecting the shirt. So N1 would be 2 there because there's two shirts to choose from. So you got two choices. And then for your pants, you have three choices. So when you put it together, you actually have two times three, which is six possible outfits that you can do. Now, if you extended this, let's say you extend this and say you have uh, two shirts, three pants, you have four different pairs of socks, you have two different belts, and you have five pair of shoes. We won't ask you about the other stuff. So operation one would be to choose the shirt. Operation two would be the number of ways that you can choose the pants. Operation 3 would be the number of ways you could choose the socks. Operation 4 would be the number of ways that you could choose the belt. And Operation 5, the number of ways you can choose the shoes. So now you've got two choices for, for shirts, three choices for pants, four for socks, two for belts, and five for shoes. And now if you multiply those uh, five numbers together, you now get 240 possible outfits. So you actually have enough outfits for for uh, eight months. Now that's of course if everything goes together properly. Now in these problems there's a trait that's not always true. There's no repetition. In other words, there was no chance of you selecting the same shirt twice or the same pants twice and so forth. The next example is an example that allows repetition. Okay, suppose you take a five question multiple choice quiz and decide to randomly select the answers. So it says, how many different answer sheets can be submitted if each answer has four responses? Well, in this example, your answers could be A, A, B, 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 or if you wanted to, you could just answer all A for them. Okay, 
So obviously you're allowed to repeat the choices mm -hmm. for the answers. Well, so what you have to do is you say, well, I have five questions. There's four ways to answer each question. There's four ways to answer the first. There's four ways to answer the second. There's four ways to answer the third. There's four ways to answer the fourth. And there's four ways to answer the fifth question. So that would actually be four to the fifth, which is 1,024 possible answer sheets that you could turn in. Now, if it had five responses, you would do it the same way, except now there's five ways to answer each question. So five ways to answer the first, five ways to answer the second, five ways to answer the third, five ways to answer the fourth, five ways to answer the fifth. So there's five to the fifth possible ways. So 3,125. So now um, you can see that the possibilities build dramatically as we add more questions. If this were 10 questions, the answers would be 4 to the 10th for A part and 5 to the 10th for B part. And those are pretty large numbers. That's why it's usually not good to just guess on multiple choice uh, quizzes or tests. Okay, now I wanted to show you this this tree diagram. A tree diagram is a visual representation of the choices. So let me just show it to you this way. Let's go back to the two shirts and the three pants. So basically this first set of branches, this first level of branches represents your first operation. So I can choose shirt one or I can choose shirt two. Now the second level of branches represents your second operation. So I can choose pant one, pant two, or pant three. But I can branch, those branches come off of shirt one, and they also come off of shirt two. So actually, you could go shirt one, pant one, shirt one, pant two, shirt one, pant three, or shirt two, pant one, shirt two, pant two, shirt two, pant three. Well, that's six possibilities. But see, we didn't need to, the tree diagram to do that, because if you have two choices for one thing followed by three choices for another thing, you just multiply them together and get two times three is six. Well... If we tried to do that on the multiple choice question, we'd get into trouble real quick. Because on the multiple choice question, let, let's say these first branches represent your answers to the first question. Well, you know you could have chose A, B, C, or D. But if you chose A on the first question, then for your second question, you could choose A, B, C, or D. Same thing for B. You could choose B on the first question, A, B, C, and D for the second. Or you could choose C on the first question, choose A, B, C, and D, or D, and then choose A, B, C, D on the second. Well, if you look at this, if you try to figure out all these possibilities, you would see each of these branches, there's four of these branches, and each of these four branches have four branches coming off of them. So basically, for just two questions, um, there's 16 possible answer sheets you could turn in. And I won't list them all, but you could go A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, B, A, B, 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 C, B, D, and so on. So that would be your 16 possible paths. Now, if you went three questions, you would have to take each one of these and you would have to do four branches coming off of those. So you'd have A, B, C, D here, then you'd have four branches coming off here, four branches coming off here, four branches coming off there, and so forth. So even if you took it out to three questions, I mean, only three questions, I mean, this thing's going to get, going to have 64 branches at the third level. So the tree diagram is good to, to help you see what's going on and why we're multiplying. But when the, when you have a large number of choices, it's not, uh, it's, it's not very practical to use a tree diagram to answer the questions. Okay. So let's look at some examples. If a married couple is going to have two children, how many possible outcomes are there if the order of births are taken into account? Well, operation one would be the first child, and there's two possible outcomes. And then operation two would be the second child, and there's two possible outcomes. And you can have repetition because you could have a boy and a boy or a, bo a girl and a girl. So that would mean that there's two possible ways for the first child to be born boy or girl, two possible ways for the second child to be born boy or girl, and that's four. So we could extend this to other things. Having multiple children, tossing multiple coins, answering multiple true-false questions follow a similar pattern. Like, for instance, how many outcomes are possible if three coins are tossed? Well, the first coin could be head or tails, so that's two choices. second coin could be head or tails, and the third coin could be head or tails. So there's eight possible outcomes. Excuse me, outcomes. What if, what if you toss five coins? Well, there's... 
again, each coin could be head or tails. So there would be um, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, or 32 possible outcomes. Okay, same thing would be true if you had three true-false questions and you want to know how many ways they can answer. Well, each true-false question has two possible answers. So 2 times 2 times 2 would be a total of eight possible ways you can answer them. And then if you had five uh, true-false questions, then it would be just like 1B up here where you would have 32 possibilities. Okay, now I don't want to spend a lot of time on this binary code, but freeze the video and read this. And basically the binary code, I threw that in there just because I thought it was interesting. And so read this binary code and um, we'll see what you think. But basically uh, the, uh, the practical application of this is for computer encryption. And so, you know, that's one of the areas that, that this binary uh, codes are used. Okay, read number two on your own, and it's pretty much like I did earlier with the different possible pieces of clothing you could put on. Let's look at number three. It says, how many possible 10-digit phone numbers are under the following conditions? No restrictions. Now, each number can be zero to nine. So if there's no restrictions, that means I can have repetition. So the first number could be 10 possibilities, the second number could be 10 possibilities, and so forth. So if you count that for all 10 possible numbers, then that would be 10 to the 10th power. So there's that, there's, that's how many phone numbers are possible. Now, if you wanted to restrict that, you might say, well, let's say the first number can't be a 0 or 1. Well, the only thing that would change would be the, the, that that only leaves you eight values to choose for the first one. But then you still have ten that you can choose for the rest of them. So eight times ten to the ninth would be uh, eight billion. Okay. Now, there's other numbers that you'd have to toss out because you couldn't use numbers that start with 911, 411, etc. But, but hopefully you can see that counting techniques are helpful in determining the possibilities. All right, let's say you had to pick a pin that consists of four digits. How many codes are possible if there's no restrictions? Well, if there's no restrictions, then just like the one above there, there's 10 possible choices for each, each number. So that would give me 1,000. And then the next one, uh, if, uh, if the digit cannot be repeated, then this is where you don't have repetition. So you, there's 10 ways for the first number, then that only leaves 9 for the second, eight for the third, and then only leave seven for the fourth. So 10 times nine times eight times seven is 5,040. And the next one said adjacent digits must be different. So for the first number, there's 10 choices, but the second number can't be what you chose here, so there's only nine choices. Well, the third number can't be what you chose just to the left of it, but it can be what you chose back over here. So the, one, the number just can't be the one directly to the left of it. And the same for the fourth. It can't be the one directly to the left. So each of the last three is going to be 9. So you have 10 times 9 times 9 times 9 is 7290. Okay, go ahead and read this on the dice and coins. I've already talked about it a little bit. So you can uh, read those examples. And then after you've read them, you can um, start the video again. Okay, if I don't get through the rest of these, just freeze the video and then just read the rest of it. So the number nine it says you can have license plates that are followed. Um, you have 26 numbers and 10 digits. So how many license plates could you make? Well, that would be 36 to the sixth power. That's if they had to have exactly each each entry had to have exactly. Uh, I mean, you had to have exactly six digits. Now, if you wanted to have um, up to but including six, then you would have to figure out all the ways you could have a one. Uh, one character plate, two character plates, three character plates, all the way up to six character plates. So you would actually have to add all of these numbers together to answer the question. I think we've run number 10 into the ground. Number 11 is pretty simple. And now number 12, how many different three-letter code words can be created for the first nine letters of the alphabet? If there are no restrictions, then it's going to be 9 times 9 times 9, which is 729. But if no letter can be repeated, then there's nine ways to choose the first, eight ways to choose the second, seven ways to choose the third. So that only gives you 504. 
So next we'll talk about permutations and combinations.